Hi, Michael. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good today. Good. Uh, I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV, as you know. Do you want to introduce yourself? You're Michael Cohen. I know that much, but you might want to say even more. I am Michael Cohen. I am a fellow at the Century Foundation and a columnist at The Guardian. At The Guardian. And right. you've written very recently about Ukraine, which, as it happens, is what we're going to talk about. No, that's good. Good timing. <laughs> you didn't know we were going to talk about Ukraine? I, you know, who knows? Uh, Go in any, any direction. So, uh, this, this started with a Twitter exchange, I guess a couple of days ago. Sure. I want you to explain it to me, because I'm mis- okay. I am mystified by the way you replied to one of my tweets. Okay. I had read this John Mearsheimer op-ed in the International New York Times about Ukraine, and there was one, one quote in it that I thought was true. He, he wrote, few American policymakers are capable of putting themselves in Putin's shoes. So I quoted that, put that in quotes, I had linked to the piece, and in response to the quote, commenting on his quote, I said, true, and good strategy requires that. Meaning good strategy requires that you put yourself in the shoes of the person, adopt their perspective, figure out what's going on in their head. I thought it was a perfectly innocent thing to say, Michael, you know? <laughs> and you reply, where does that argument take you? That we should simply look the other way at violations of global norms and international law? No, Michael, I don't recall saying that. And I'm curious, why would you infer that? It, well, see, I think your reaction is actually a common one, and that, that's why I'm interested in well, it. Well, yeah, my reaction was actually not to you, it was to Mersheimer's piece. So Mersheimer's basic argument is that, look, the Russians have uh, legitimate interests here in Ukraine, uh, and we should respect those interests um, and, you know, in, in a sense, sort of recognize Russia's sphere of, in, of influence uh, in, in uh, the former Soviet Union. And, you know, I think that's true to an extent. I mean, that's part of the reason why we haven't offered NATO membership to Georgia and Ukraine. I think smartly so. Um, but we shouldn't look the other way when he exercises, you know, his sort of sphere of influence or, or tries to affect it by violating international law and violating, you know, long-held norms about, you know, cross-border attacks. I think the problem, I think, with Mearsheimer's argument, and this is part of just sort of Mearsheimer's, you know, DNA when it comes kind of thing, he doesn't care about the international law. He doesn't care about the fact that these are norms being violated. He's more interested in sort of a very... You know, the realist perspective on on right. how we should sort of think about Russia's uh, uh, you know interest in the near abroad, and I, I think you have to think a little more broadly than that. Okay, but it does seem to me, and you're and you're right. I mean, I in my mind, there's a good part of Mearsheimer, which is that he does look at things from the point of view of other foreign leaders, which I think uh, our, our leaders often fail to do, and our common our commentators often fail to do. And then you're right; he doesn't seem to. Uh, care much about international law, or at least doesn't think it's realistic to to try to uphold it. I, on the other hand, am fetishistic about international law, actually, but I have, uh, but, I, but I do, the question I have is how can the United States lecture Russia about uh, respecting international borders and upholding international law, given our own behavior? You know, <sighs> It's a hard argument to respond to because, I mean, in a sense, I agree with you, but you're talking to somebody who basically thought that what we did in Iraq was wrong, even if it had some veneer of support in international law. Veneer. Uh, I use that. Apology. I don't mean, no, I didn't even think it had a veneer. Did you oh, I think it had a veneer. Oh, I, I think, I mean, there's no question that, that Saddam was in violation of the international, of Security Council Resolution. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Whoa, 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 wait. Let's stop right there. Now, now first of all, let me get clear. You're saying you oppose the Iraq war? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, then you and I have that in common. So neither of us would be hypocrit- as hypocritical as the average right. person in condemning Russia. But, uh, well, we shouldn't relitigate this, but I would say, first of all, Kofi, Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the UN, called it an illegal war. Secondly, um, if my neighbor is in violation of the law, it's not lawful for me to break in and, 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 and correct the thing. Okay. Well, and, 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 and that's why if, if, if Iraq is in violation of Security Council resolutions, the Security Council has to authorize punitive intervention for that to be legal. That's just course. simple and, and straightforward. And, and of course, and that's the, that's the debate. Is did, did it's, the not, it's not a debate. <laughs> no, 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 hold, right. on, hold on, hold on. The, the resolution is September 2002 that the U.S. got passed the Security Council unanimously yeah. to basically force Iraq to open up again their uh, the nuclear or their weapons destruction uh, uh, capabilities to UN inspectors did call for I can't I think it was grave consequences I can't remember the exact yeah, they, op- they now, opened them up to the inspectors I'm not endorsing his argument there's an argument to be made that yeah. that resolution I'm sorry but that's that's not a serious argument 
It, it's but, not. But anyway, but it's so, a diversion because so here's we, both, wait, point. we both oppose the Iraq War. So right. good. But, but, but I guess the point is, even if you think there's a veneer of support for it in Iraq, there's no veneer of support for it with what uh, Russia is doing in, in Crimea. None whatsoever. Right. There's, there's no element of there's no veneer in Iraq. There was no veneer. That's not what they're doing. But 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 here's but this is related to looking at it from Russia's point of view. And again, uh, you know, I want to insist that the inference I thought you were drawing in Twitter, which is that once you start looking at things from other people's point of view, it means you're excusing their behavior. I'm not doing that. But I think it is it is uh, reasonable to ask, can't they look at our behavior? You know, if we considered Grenada a sufficient threat so that we had to invade, we considered Iraq a sufficient threat so that we had to invade, okay? They have a situation where this naval base that is of immense importance to them, its status is suddenly in jeopardy. I mean, that's obviously a more direct threat to their perceived interests, you know, from an objective point of view, than, than, than Iraq, than Grenada. So do you at least concede that we are actually not in a position to preach to these guys? Uh, look, as a nation. About, I am not, I am preaching as Michael Cohen. Right. Uh, the U.S., you know, I, I and I and look, this administration, for better or for worse, you know, certainly uh, w- this president was not supportive of the Iraq War. I don't think he's been hypocritical. You can say John Kerry is if you want, fine. But my point is that that the U.S., what, irrespective of what happened in Iraq, irrespective of whether we were hypocrites or not, the U.S. should not let this kind of cross-border attack and this kind of violation of sovereignty stand. Right? I think the U.S. should stand up to it because it is a, a violation of, of not only you know international law and, and these international norms. But, it, you know, when you allow countries to do this with impunity, it tends to uh, erode uh, the security guarantees that have really made the world safer over the last oh. 20 or 30 years or so. Right. right. So my, my sense of this is that, you know, you have to sort of say countries that do this, this is wrong and you will pay a price for doing so. I feel this way about international law uh, generally, that it's very important to uphold. And that's why and you're not upholding it if you as, as the most powerful nation in the world consistently violate it, as we have done under Barack Obama, by the way, and I'll elaborate if you want, um, and, and, and yet demand that every, everyone else uh, abide by it. That's not upholding it. So here's what I could support, is if Barack Obama got up and said, I want to be clear that we should not have invaded Iraq, A, I should not have launched drone strikes without the expressed, expressed consent of the governments of the nations I, I, where I killed people. I should not have uh, even even the Stuxnet thing, which wound up like blowing up a centrifuge or something, that is technically an act of war. And and sure. and if Barack Obama, th- those are all violations of international law. And if Barack Obama would get up on TV and say, we're going to turn over a new leaf, we've seen the light, international law is important, fine. But if he's not going to do that, he is not helping respect for international law by pretending that we abide by it when we don't. Again, I, I just, I, to me, I mean, not to, I don't, I, to me, it's just, this is a bit of a red herring argument. I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with you that the U.S. is more consistent when it comes to national law. I just don't think that because we're not consistent, we should, in this particular situation, sort of say, okay, well, we can't say anything because, because you know, we've been bad in these situations. I mean, I think that's not an argument that I find Wait. sustainable. So you, you think our consistent policy should be to demand that people re- do what we refuse to do. That should just be the way we go about in the world saying, no, that, no, that's American exceptionalism, right? We don't have to abide by the law. And, you, and I'm serious. Uh, and but look, I'm not, I, I, I think we should abide by the law. Look, I've written, I wrote a piece of, uh, last year basically saying that the U.S. Uh, was violating national law with, the, with drone strikes in Pakistan. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, I, not disagreeing with this point. I think to some extent we probably, we may, we've really violated American law with the, the war in Libya. We may have violated international law. I'm not disagreeing with this point. I mean, I think we should be more respectful of it. But I don't know how, where that gets you. I mean, you know, it doesn't mean that you, it's because you're not, uh, you know, as, as and, and first of all, we do, by and large, um, adhere to national law. In more cases than not, we do adhere to it. I don't think any, any more than Russia does, really. What are, I mean, what are, I, I don't, I, over I mean, the last three you decades? You try to quantify if you want, but, but the argument you're making is that we do it all the time, but I don't think we do it all the time. I think we do it occasionally, and we I, do it in ways that are, that, are, that are damaging. I mean, we did it on Kosovo, for example, in a way that was, I think, quite damaging. Uh, I just mean every president I, I, in recent... I just mean policy. every president, basically. I mean, uh, I don't remember George W. Bush, actually. I'm not sure, but, but Reagan, Clinton, um, jo- uh, I, I mean, George, George W., yeah, but George Herbert Walker, I'm not sure, but 
four of the last five presidents for sure. Probably, probably all five. Anyway, I, I, um, I don't know. This is just how I don't like. We can say. I mean, the other thing is, I would say our interventions, uh, our illegal interventions, are actually less defensible than theirs. I mean, in Iraq, we went in halfway around the world from us, uh, and and we knew we were going to kill people. They haven't killed anybody so far. They have the, the, the support. And again, I'm against it. And I wish we were, I wish we had a history that entitled us to stand up and demand compliance with international law. But this is just a ridiculous way to go. Well, about I mean, it. I, I'll tell you what, honestly, I mean, I'm making more trouble for saying this, but I think, uh, I'm, I'm not interested in what's more not defensible, but I think from an international law perspective, our, the war in Iraq was I think, actually more defensible than it was to U.S. national security interests. Um, again, I mean, Saddam was in violation of, you know, security council resolutions and so forth. And, you know, there's some arguments to be made that should have been enforced. And, and we did have, you know, for the record, we had a uh, relatively, you know, broad uh, coalition of support for the war in Iraq. I mean, Russia's on, on an island on this one. But I just don't see where we, this we argument don't. takes you. I mean, even if I, even if, I mean, I acknowledge sort of all your points that you've made, but I, I still think that having, you know, noted the U.S. hypocrisy on, 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 on certain issues, that doesn't change the fact that what Russia's done is wrong. What Russia's doing is in violation of the United UN Charter. It's in violation of, of uh, 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 certainly Ukraine's sovereignty, and it should be responded to. I'm not saying we should go to war over it. I mean, I'm certainly not, no one's saying that, but I'm saying we should certainly not just sort of sit back and ignore it like, like it's not happening. I mean, it's a serious uh, crisis, and I think once again, once two countries keep doing this, uh, it, it weakens the the uh, the norms that we that we have had and that have been maintained for 20 years or so, or more than that. On uh, cross-border attacks like this, but in a way, it, my, my line of thinking gets back to the point I was making: putting yourselves in the shoes of others. Again, it's like if this is supposed to freak the world out, Russia intervening in a in a piece of land that was part of Russia 60 years ago, where probably most of the people support it. If that's supposed to freak us out, we're supposed to go, "My God, what are they going to do next?" How do you how do you think the world should have responded to our doing Iraq, halfway around the world? Uh, you know, it, it's like. I just, I just, I, I am just, you know. Well, look, there's two issues here. First of all, look at the Security Council vote today. 13 out of 15 voted, voted uh, to basically say this referendum in Crimea is a joke. Uh, China abstained and, and the Russians vetoed it. Yeah. Um, I mean, to your other point about Iraq, I mean, this sticks this, this to a certain power dynamic. I mean, we are the biggest power on the block. I mean, we can, we can actually fight illegal stupid wars and not pay a huge price for it. I'm not supportive of that. I don't think we should fight illegal stupid wars. But, you know, well, Russia we can, can do, we hey, hey Mike, but Michael, by that logic, in this case, look, Russia's holding the cards. They can do this and nobody can stop them. Nobody can, look, nobody can stop them because no one wants to use force to stop them. But they can be punished for it. They can pay, they can pay a, a, a economic price, they can pay a well, diplomatic price, and they will. They will. And, and now, and, 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 you know, we can, uh, I mean, the other point I'd make is that they don't have, I don't think, a totally crazy argument um, well, there's also the whole business of, you know, I all, the other thing about our, our failure to see things from the point of view of others is I think that has led our whole policy toward Russia, including NATO expansion, to be uh, needlessly provocative from their point of view. I mean, first of all, uh, okay, two points on that. Needlessly provocative, I would say that the actions of Russia over the past two weeks would show that expanding NATO was probably a good idea. That's the first thing I'd say. The second thing is the fact that we did not expand NATO to Georgia and Ukraine, which Obama opposes would suggest that we are respectful of Russia's sphere influence or, or not putting too much pressure on Russia. We have we're, we've worked with Russia repeatedly over the past five years, or Obama has, on START, mm. on Afghanistan, on Iran, on Syria. We have worked with them repeatedly. We have respected them in ways that, you know, you could argue the last president didn't respect them very much. See, but that, uh, that's, just, sure that's just you as an American issues. saying that. From their point of view, it looks like we've been pushing NATO uh, toward their borders, as we have. Well, and by the way, and, and by the way, I heard Leslie Gelb, and he would know better than I say that actually, after the at some point after the Berlin Wall fell, we pledged to them that we would not expand NATO eastward. And I know what you're going to say. Well, we're the most powerful country. We, but I mean, don't you? But don't you see Russia's actions today as somewhat, um, uh, in the context of those actions, NATO expansion being defensible? I mean, NATO. Expansion no, I think you can argue it either way. I think you can argue that NATO expansion helped put them in the mind, which included, by the way, our kind of courting Ukraine, NATO expansion uh, put them in a more defensive uh, mindset. They find it threatening. I think you could argue that. I don't know which is the case, but... Um, 
I mean, they find it threatening, fine. They find it threatening. But the fact is they are threatening. The fact is that Russia has a long and, 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 and notable history of, of expansion, of attacking their neighbors, of trying to you know, seize their countries uh, around unlike them. Unlike us? I mean, Wait, unlike us? Yes, unlike us. We don't, we don't attack countries? I, I, I may have forgotten when we basically took over all of Western Europe and, and declared it basic and you know, basically uh, clamped down any oh, kind well, of... Oh, well, you're talking about more than half a century ago. You're, no, I mean, I'm talking about the, the Soviet Union. We brought in you know, republics and certainly uh, into the, the Republic of Central Asia and uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic states in 1940. I'm talking about the invasion of Finland. I'm talking right. about Poland. I'm right. talking about Afghanistan. I'm talking about Eastern Europe. I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, Russia has been long been expansionist and aggressive imperialist country. Now, you could argue they may not be that country today, but they the last, you know, five years, they've attacked Georgia, now they've attacked Ukraine. Six years, attacked Georgia, now Ukraine. Um, there, and, 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 you know, there is good reason for Eastern European countries, for the Baltic states, to be fearful of Russian expansion. Um, and I, you, I can understand the, the counter to, to, NATO, to, to the, the criticism of NATO expansion, but I think this incident sort of sh- does provide evidence that there was good reason to be fearful about Russia's uh, uh, you know, expansionist uh, interests uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the former well, Soviet I, Union. I think you can argue that the fear itself led us to do things, um, you know, even with Ukraine, the EU could have set it up in a way, e- the EU told Ukraine they had to make a choice, right? You can imagine a deal where, they, where, where the EU worked something out where Ukraine could have maintained more economic ties with Russia, uh, but they didn't do that. And, Look, and, and, and again, yeah. you know, that's what comes out of fearing Russian expansion. We've got to wrest Ukraine away from their sphere of influence. You could argue that that determination helped create this crisis. No, I don't agree with that. I mean, I think, first of all, you're conflating NATO and the EU, and I think those are two different things, because it, it, plays, it speaks to Washington's influence. I mean, Washington certainly is a big proponent, or America's a big proponent of NATO expansion. EU expansion is a different issue, and it relates more to the Europeans. But the fact is that the Ukrainians, any agency here at all, they entered in negotiation with the EU. Yanukovych entered in negotiation with the EU. Half the country wants to be part of the EU. I mean, they, they count also. Right. And so I think this is the problem. Get back to Mirsheimer's original argument. Mirsheimer kind of ignores that point. He says, well, Russia should have a buffer. So thus we ignore the, the Ukrainians. That's not a, tw- a very 21st century uh, view, I would say. I mean, I think the Ukrainians have a right to decide on their own uh, who they want to be partnered with. And the fact is that that, you know, Putin well, is exercising influence well, in a way so- to prevent them from, from making that choice. Well, of course, the self-determination argument works both ways. I mean, he would say the, the Crimeans have a right to decide who they are. But I'm not defending the, the Mearsheimer argument because I said he doesn't care about international law. And I'm not against us. Uh, you know, if we can if we can figure out, uh, uh, you know, a set of punishments that are not self-defeating in various senses, sure. fine. And there's various senses in which they could be self-defeating. I mean, one is you've got to hold something in reserve, right? You, c- yeah. you can't unload all your ammunition over Crimea, because that's not the big threat. The big, no, no, threat, it, and, the big threat is eastern Ukraine. And, and the commentary so far has been really, I think, in this regard, kind of, kind of ridiculous, because it's basically saying Obama should unload everything now. It's not the way you play this. And in fact, I think, to, you know, to your initial point about putting yourself in Putin's shoes, I think the, the administration tried to give Putin an off-ramp here. I mean, I think Kerry meeting with Lavrov, I think they, he tried to find a way out of this, this situation. What and the Russians ramp? are not taking the off-ramp. What was the off-ramp? I, I mean, I don't know what he offered him. I, but I mean, I don't know what he offered either, but I'm saying there, there, there were concessions that could have been made by the Ukrainians. There were certainly ways to defuse this situation. Mm-hmm. The, the Russians, it seems to me, have made the situation worse, right? They, they sort of doubled down on, on this aggressive, uh, you know, with, with these military, uh, uh, whatever they're doing in eastern Ukraine right now, with these territory, but certainly the, uh, you know, mobilizing their troops on the border. I mean, they are sticking their, their finger not only in the Ukrainian's eye, but in the, in, in the West side. Well, I, the, again, to put yourself in their shoes, they see, well, I don't know, they may see that as a tit-for-tat thing because Obama has been pretty full-throated. I mean, I think given what a weak hand he has, he's done too much talking and so has Kerry because, because they put themselves in a situation where basically we're going to lose, right? They're going to lose. Obama's going to lose. Kerry's going to lose. The, you, you know, and 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 the more the more they talk out loud about making demands of Russia, I think in a way the worse they're going to look. But in any event, I think I think Russia is well. I think two things. First of all, um, they're doing that. I think they're 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 retaliating for for all of the uh, all of the rhetoric they're hearing from the U.S. But also, um, you know, and and we've moved some aircraft carriers and stuff too. But also, um, I mean the 
in a way, the hopeful scenario is they are preparing themselves for a bargaining round. And, and, and uh, the hopeful scenario, I said, and, you know, because look, tomorrow after we, you know, we're taping this Saturday, this vote will be either they will vote <laughs> for annexation I think or, the, or, the, or the vote will be depicted that way by the people <laughs> counting the votes. Either way, right. the official outcome will be that. And, um, the, uh, and then Putin will have that in hand. And it may be that he pauses then, and who knows? He may, you know, that... It, it's possible, you know, and, and I hope that happens. But I, I want to, look, I want to go back to what you said a second ago about Obama losing. Obama's not losing here. This, we, we, we don't have enough interest here for us to win or lose. We, we have tried to resolve this situation. Uh, we've put, we've expended diplomatic energy to do it. The person losing here is Putin. I mean, and obviously the Ukrainians are losing too. But Putin is losing. I mean, what, that vote today in the Security Council, this, this vote is a, is a disaster for Russia. It isolates them diplomatically. It isolates them politically. It's just a vote. It's just a vote. It's not just a vote. It's an indication that the world is against them on this, which means that and, that if they maintain the position that they've taken on this, it's only going to get worse. There's going to be more economic sanctions against them. Look, look, look at what Merkel's been saying the past couple of days. And she was well, the one who was sort of on the fence well, a little bit. that's the- why there is the thinking that he will enter out of bargaining. And what he'll settle for is... Something that saves face for both sides gives Crimea either, well, sovereignty or huge autonomy within Ukraine, and 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 makes him damn sure that he will be have effective control over that naval base, which, which is he already has, which he already has, and he wasn't going to lose, and he well, wasn't going to lose it. The Ukrainians weren't going to take it away from him. I mean, the fact is, well, that- no, no, no. Again, Mike, I mean, you put yourself in his shoes from his point of view. Ukraine was looking suddenly quite unreliable. This, this, this new... Okay, and how do they look now? They look even more unreliable. Yeah, but now he's got the naval base. So I, I'm saying... Naval base. I mean, I, this is the point. Of, this is what's so silly about this. I mean, he is putting... He has heard... Look, he, the point of the point here was pressure on the Ukrainians. That's, I'm sure, why he did this. To, to not, you know, move to, to press to prove Western in every direction. Now what are they going to do? Now they basically view their neighbor as an expansionist neighbor who's taking over their territory. This is going to drive them even further into the Western orbit. Further into the EU's orbit. I mean, this is, well, this is, he has lost Ukraine for the foreseeable future as, as an ally. Well, and, and that's not a good, a good move for Putin at all. Well, I don't know the relative weight he puts on that and on knowing for damn sure he's got this naval base. I don't know. But annexation gives him the naval base. Another downside of annexation uh, of, U, uh, of Crimea for him is the demographic effect on Ukraine. Just demographically, it makes it slightly more anti Russian, just ethnically yes. less, less favorable toward Russia. So there yes. is that downside. Um, and, and that's why, but, but see, your perspective is why some people are making, you're suggesting he actually cares much more about the disposition of Ukraine than hanging on for sure, sure, sure to the Crimea and yeah. that base. That's if you're right, that is the logic behind people who say he's going to enter a round of bargaining and somehow he wants to be assured of, well, he'll get a, a lot of autonomy for Crimea at the minimum, but other assurances about the future disposition of Ukraine. I don't know what those, I don't know. Even, even if he does that, right, he's poisoned the well with the Ukrainians in a very significant way. I mean, the relationship between, the, between Russia and Ukraine is going to be very, very bad for, for a very long time after this, I would think. He's also poisoned well with the Europeans, who, yeah. who now, I think, view him in much, even much more negative than they did before, and maybe much more inclined to end their alliance, for example, on Russian natural gas. I mean, this is just, this is boomerang against him in, in ways I don't think he fully thought about before he went into, he went into Crimea. And I, I just think in the long run, this is not going to work out well for him. I mean, w- getting to Crimea, he already had basically like, you know, he didn't have control over it, but he certainly had some, some sort of de facto influence over it. And he already had the Russian naval base. Now he may keep Crimea, but he's going to lose Ukraine, he's going to lose the Europeans, he's going to isolate right. himself diplomatically. I, I just think in all in all, I mean, it's just a, it's a bad again, situation. When, when you say he had the naval base, he did have a long-term lease agreement from Ukraine. But when the first thing that new parliament does is pass that anti-Russian language law. If yeah. you're him, you got to say, hmm, I wonder what we can actually count on in the way of commitments from this government. And, right. and that's not a crazy thing for him to think. Not a crazy thing for him to think. I, I, not crazy at all. And I, and I can understand the rationale of him then going into Crimea and saying it's a way to exercise influence. I think he underestimated the, the reaction to it. I think he underestimated how much this would isolate him diplomatically. He may have. Uh, I think there are other ways to exercise influence other than seizing a piece of territory and basically, you know, pissing off the Europeans and pissing off the U.S. Yeah. Although, um, 
it's possible that he's going to be a smart gambler about it. It, it. In a way, it makes sense, even if he plans on negotiation, to go ahead and get this vote locked up and say, okay, now I can, by snapping my fingers, complete the yeah. annexation of Crimea. Now, do you want to talk seriously about all the things I'd like to see change in the world? Right. And, I mean, he could try to do that. I just I wonder how much how much influence he's going to have in that conversation, because ultimately, you know, if 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 the Europeans up the economic sanctions against him, he's going to find himself being squeezed. I'm sure he's being squeezed by his uh, his his oligarchs and his some of his you know more Western advisors who see this as a disaster for the Russian economy, a disaster for you know the oligarchs' fortunes. I mean, this is not a good situation. Yeah. This, but yeah, but also remember, their worst position diplomatically vis a vis the rest of the world. The one thing to remember is it works for him politically at home. I think, and it, and politicians, also, in my experience, respond first and foremost. Uh, to those incentives. And and there's a myth that kind of autocrats or whatever you want to call them, like, don't care about popular opinion. I think they care more than democratically elected presidents because they can I actually get overthrown. I think they care. I mean, but I, I also think that the benefit to, to Putin for that is 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 somewhat marginal. I oh, mean, I think he, he plays to the crowd in Russia. Sure, he does. But but I mean, he, he's, as you said, he's, he is an authoritarian leader. Um, sure, but but he has seen the, right now in, in Russia. But he has seen the ferment in the streets, and he can't love that. And he right. and, and he's playing to the nationalist uh, crowd. Absolutely. But when this comes back and boomerangs against Russia, you know, will he still will he maintain his support? Maybe he will. But I mean, I don't. How much more would he have lost had he not gone into Crimea? That's the better question to ask. I mean, what was the marginal political value of going into Crimea? I, 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 I doubt it was that. He may have been genuinely worried about the naval base. I don't think he'd have to be crazy to be worried about that. Um, yeah. The, but, but uh, you know, I uh, the, the other and, and right now he may be saying, well, let's see really what kind of sanctions they can muster and how long they'll last. Because the thing about sanctions is it's a two way street. They hurt. They hurt you, too, when you're the sanction. Sure. Sure. And they'll hurt the Europeans if, if we go forward with it. Sure. And, and it may take a while. Look, it took how many, how many years, uh, you know, from Obama taking office to getting the, the Iranians to the table? It's a serious negotiation. It took five, five and a half years. So it could be, I mean, this may be a long-term process. But again, like Russia, you know, their, their sort of vision of itself as a great power has been sort of negatively affected by this. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're no longer a trustworthy country in any real significant way. And I think they're isolated. I mean, you have China abstaining from the vote today. That's got to be a, a bad sign in, in Moscow. They can't be happy to see the Chinese not kind of backing them on this. Because it just makes them, again... China always abstains, don't they? They just... Well, but, you know, China has been... Look, China and Russia both voted to veto uh, resolution on Syria. I mean, they've been relatively on, on the same mm-hmm. page in the Security Council. This suggests they're not on the same page. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also, again, suggests, and using this word, but suggests the Russians are, are even more isolated, you know, internationally than they were uh, before this happened. So, I, you know, I don't see how this works out well for Putin. I mean, again, getting Crimea is a, a marginal gain to him. The political gain is marginal. The, the larger cost to his economy, um, to his, how he's seen in the world, his relationship with the U.S., all of that, and, and, the, and the Europeans, all of that's going to be negatively affected. And, and by the way, not for like a week or a month, but for years to come. This, this is going to – this will oh, – Oh, we'll see. We'll see. It depends on – I mean – it depends on what happens. It, it, you know, it depends on whether he chooses to opt for uh, – negotiation. And the truth is, he still has leverage. I mean, even if he annexes uh, Crimea, we will be plausibly fearful about what could happen in eastern Ukraine. Now, he should be plausibly fearful because that could become his Vietnam. Absolutely. But... Uh, uh, Vietnam's a bit strong, but it certainly would be... Would not. I don't think it would be... A, it, it, very little gain from doing that. Why does he want to basically have to control eastern Ukraine, have to, you know, feed... Uh, Feed all the the, the Rus- ethnic Russians in eastern Ukraine. I can't see how that's, that's right. A good... But the danger is that things spin out of control, and if if, yes. if lots of ethnic Russians get massacred somewhere, then it's actually hard for him not to. Yeah, then he be, that, exactly that, that that's that's his own fault for, for basically well, making. Well, okay, uh, but I mean, it could spin out of control, and and that's uh, that's a concern. So, what else do we need to opine on? Uh, <laughs> we've agreed that I'm right and you're wrong. What else is there? <laughs> well, I think to get back to the initial point about putting yourself in the shoes of. Of other leaders, I mean, I think that is important in the situation. I mean, I do think that, and I think that Obama, to his credit, actually kind of did in trying to find a diplomatic way out of this, you know, a way that would prevent, that would give sort of a Russia a chance to save face. Um, that they didn't take it, then forced you to sort of say, okay, what's behind, you know, door, door number two? And door number two is pressure, door number two is, is sanctions, door number two is, you know, 
uh, political uh, you know, isolation for the Russians. I mean, that, that's kind of, you only go so far and put yourself in somebody else's shoes. You also have to sort of think of your own interests, right? And the, I mean, the U.S. doesn't, I think, also doesn't care too much if Ukraine, about Ukraine's disposition, whether it's pro-Russian or pro-European. They prefer pro-European, but I don't think they care that much. Well, although what Victoria about, Newland, I haven't listened to the Victoria Newland conversation, but it, but it sounds from the news reports like we were actively, right? I, I define actively. Well, I mean, I think Victoria Newland was, I'm sure, trying to counsel the opposition, but I, the extent to which, you know, uh, we were willing to spend a great deal of diplomatic capital on behalf of the opposition, uh, you know, call me skeptical on that. I mean, I think maybe you could argue me you may have made a mistake recognizing the new government so quickly, uh, but certainly, you know, after Yanukovych's actions and after the massacre of, of people in the streets, I mean, it was not, on, not, not surprising that we would basically go out and, and recognize the opposition, and also given some level of legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. That may have been the, the thinking as well. Um, yeah, although again, on that point, on the question of the legitimacy of the Ukrainian government, it's not crazy for Putin to raise questions. I mean, this is a government that fled for fear of its life. Um, that's, you know, some people call that a coup. This is, it's less of a coup than Egypt in my mind, but, Certainly. but, but it's, um, it's not exactly an orderly and manifestly constitutional transition of government, I don't think. It's not. I mean, but look, I, this is a great question, by the way, as to why Yanukovych left. I mean, and, you know, why? I think, well, he says, why doubt him? He thought he was going to get killed. He may very well have. I mean, that may be, he may have been right about that, or he may be exaggerated. Yeah. I have no idea. Um, you know, the Ukrainian parliament is, was democratically elected as he was. So they had a right to certainly, you know, to you know, push him out and to create a new government. But I, look, it's an odd argument, I find, that people sort of defending Yanukovych, and I'm not saying you are, but on the grounds he's democratically elected. I mean, he was killing his own people in the streets of, of Kiev. And no, in very few situations, would any of us think that, that was acceptable? But that, I, I have a question about that. I really haven't focused on this, but I know Anatole Levin was saying that there is some degree of credibility, or at least, I don't know, that, you know, this counterclaim that some of the killing was done by, well, it's like a false flag operation by right. one of the fascist parties. Can we dismiss that claim altogether? I mean, I, it, look, I, I think we can dismiss it in the sense that clearly before that the, sn the sniper attacks even were happening, you had Ukrainian police basically killing protesters and basically, uh, you know, going after demonstrators with, 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 uh, with, with brutal force. So I think that certainly, you know, that has, even if you think there's a false flag operation, that's the part of the conversation mm -hmm. too. Yanukovych did not handle this well. And by the way, this is the thing also about this that none of you are talking about. This crisis happened because Yan Yanukovych screwed up. I mean, he handled this very, very poorly. And he handled it in such a way that, that almost forced him to leave the country because, you know, he used force, he lost political support, he signed this deal uh, with the opposition, he fled, he basically put, you know, Putin in a terrible position. But a lot of this is because of his own actions also. I mean, go back even further, his corruption. Yeah, no, he's not, a, he's not an especially defensible character. No, he's not. And, and he certainly, in a lot but, of ways, hurt Putin. My, no, my, my only point is, if you're Russia, and you're finding this whole thing threatening, and the fact that our official, Victoria Newland is, you know, is kind of trying to, you know, you, you know, there is a sense in which, yes, Western Europe and the United States were trying to yank Ukraine into our orbit. Not that that didn't have the support of a lot of Ukrainian people, but from Putin's point of view, there is the sense in which we're actively doing that. And then this government changes under dubious circumstances. And you'll, you'll agree, I think, that the new regime has its dubious elements itself. Oh, absolutely. And, absolutely. and, and no certainly question. its elements that are ardently against Russian interests. And I yeah. just don't think it's crazy. I just don't think it's, I guess I would say, I don't think it's surprising that he freaked out a little. Oh, I don't think it's, look, I don't think it's surprising at all. I think him freaking out makes perfect sense. I think uh, that... That doesn't justify then, and I'm saying you're arguing that, justify what he has done. You know, he can, he can certainly be upset about where Ukraine is going and going away from, from, from Russia, but that doesn't justify then, you know, yeah. invading and taking over. No, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a stickler for international law. I'm against what he did. My, my only opening point was uh, the U.S. I, I just think it's driving me crazy that the U.S. is not taking international law more seriously itself because I think it's actually vital to the security of the world that we do it. I agree. And, and, it, makes, and it, it makes a special sense for a waning hegemon, and we are inevitably going to lose power relative to the rest of the world, assuming prosperity continues to grow in other parts of the world. It makes a special sense for us to try to construct a world uh, governed by the rule of law. 
you know, bef- before our power fades any further. And I agree, yet- but yeah, but you know what's funny about the power argument? I can make the, case, the opposite case that this if this incident actually increases American power because this one it, it incident. Should- the, the Crimea situation. Maybe That's, I'm not arguing that it doesn't right now, but so but go ahead. No, but I think in the sense that if you're a European countries and you're unhappy with the U.S. over say you know the NSA spying or whatever it may be, you know this incident may certainly crystallize in your mind that there are much bigger threats out there, right? The, the threat. I, I don't actually think that Russia is a serious military threat to anybody outside of Eastern Ukraine, but you know if you're the Europeans, it's certainly in the back of your head. And certainly you want the, the, the U.S. to be as, as, as loyal supporter, especially in NATO, as they've been in the past. And I just think the reaction to this speaks volumes. And your Iraq example is, 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 a, good, is a good point here. The, the world has basically come out, except for countries that are, you know, that are basically under the thumb of Putin or, or near enough that can't go against him, have, have been in support of the U.S. position on this. Right? And you contrast that with the Iraq position, which you argue is less sensible, and you may be right. It just shows that, that, that the American, America is powerful enough of a country that we can do bad things and not pay a huge price. And we can also you know, bring together these sort of coalitions to oppose things we don't like also. We have that power. We have power that no other country can match. And countries don't want to get on our bad side uh, because ultimately you know, uh, we are the most powerful country in the world. I'm not saying that as a, as, you know, that they're, they're downsides yeah, to that, obviously. But, they, but it's not like they're just fall, falling in line with this. As you said, the Europeans see some cause for concern, rightly or yeah, wrongly. They do. They, I'm sure they do. Yeah. And I'm sure this makes them you know, want to stand the, the, the good side of the Americans as much as possible. And there's also the question of various politicians saving face. You know, the EU had lined up with Ukraine. That's where their politicians are. Obama has now gone out on a rhetorical limb opposing this. So at this point, you know, that's a lot of the dynamic is politicians thinking about how they look. Well, yes, but I think, and I think that's, you could say that's what happened with Merkel also. Merkel tried to resolve this. She didn't take as harsh a tone initially. Putin kind of blew her off, and now she's like she's a little ticked off. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, that may be uh, the more that Putin escalates this, I think the more the Europeans are going to sort of, you know, uh, ramp up their own rhetoric and ramp up their own sort of uh, uh, inclination to, to, to punish the Russians for this. Yeah. I mean, well, I think that's the big that's that, that's what's happening with Putin basically not backing down. I, I just hope they calibrate their sanctions wisely yes. and leave plenty of arrows in their quiver to dissuade him from going beyond Crimea. Agreed. I mean, I think it's, it'd be a mistake to put everything in the pot right now, but you can certainly you can certainly make them suffer a little bit. You can't, I mean, it's going to be hard to make them pay a huge price. We have very few levers at our disposal, and right. it will rely much more on the Europeans than on the U.S. I mean, we really, without the Germans on board, I mean, only so much that we can do. We can't get the U.N. to go along with it, so basically we're relying on creating a coalition. Right. Easier said than done. Okay. So then you are not, as your tweet might have suggested, against putting yourself in other people's shoes. I know I'm not. I try to do it all the time. But, you know, <laughs> well, there, uh, there are limits. I will there say, if you oppose uh, Iraq and Kosovo, you are one of the few, uh, and you are now indignant about the, the uh, Russia's behavior, you are one of the few Americans who is entitled to be <laughs> indignant. I am another one who's entitled to be indignant. Uh, well, you know, I was, uh, okay, so I was opposed to Iraq. I was opposed to Kosovo, but I, I, I'm, I may have been wrong about that one. I, I have to think more about it. Uh, I think I think I think it's a hard question to ask whether it was the right thing for us to do. Um, I well, think on you know as opposed to the surge, as opposed I'm opposed to this. I mean I think I'm I'm generally opposed to most American wars, frankly. Uh, I think usually because they're they they, they they're um, they're pointless and they actually end up doing more harm than good for our, our national security interests. They do. And I think in the case of Russia, I'd say the same thing. This is going to do more harm than good for the Russians. Yeah. No well, question. I, uh, I think Kosovo was a tougher call morally than something like Iraq. But in terms of the precedent with respect to international law, yeah. it is taken by Russia, as, and not crazily, as, a, as an analogy to both what it did in Georgia and what it's um, doing now. Right. And, and, and we, we gave them that opportunity, and, and they, they have certainly mentioned that. I think that's one of the issues, I think, with, with, with our involvement in Kosovo. And I, I, mean, I think my bigger issue is really with how we went about it. I think we went about it in a very poorly planned manner. But in the end, I mean, look, I would argue that... The, the end may justify the means when it comes to Kosovo. I mean, there was certainly, you know, it was a humanitarian emergency, and certainly, you know, by our intervention, I think we sort of stopped that from happening, um, and, you know, the process created a, a democratic... I mean, another, another, thing Russia is citing, another thing Russia is citing is our uh, exceeding the mandate, uh, uh, the UN mandate in Libya, which we did exceed, I think. We totally did. 
And, I, and I've said, we totally did. And I've heard that many times. I think it was absolutely unjustifiable the way that we went in there and said, we're going to go in there to save, to, to, to protect, to, right. Tech people. And ultimately, ultimately it's regime change. It's regime change. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the Russians and Chinese have a real, have a real issue with that. And, and they're right. They have a fair issue to, 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 uh, on that point that we, we did, we did basically lie about what our intentions were. Well, there. the other thing, and just, just on this theme of putting yourself in other people's shoes, I think in Syria, once Obama said Assad must go, I mean, Obama had just gotten in the habit of saying that about world leaders, I think, after after Libya, you know. Right. But, but but once he said that, that just rules out a lot of possible, well, not that there are that many diplomatic solutions, but it takes some of them off the table if you're going to stick with that policy because Assad yes. doesn't want to go, okay? You yeah, can imagine yeah. di- negotiated solutions, maybe involving partition, whatever, that actually stop the killing, that don't, you know, but you can't imagine him abiding a negotiated solution uh, that involves his stepping down. I don't think realistically. Well, I, look, but I can't imagine a negotiated solution in which Assad could stay in power. I mean, I think the opposition would rightfully be have a problem with that. But there's not going to be a negotiated solution anytime no, soon. In, in, in now less, now less than ever. Now less than. I ever. don't think this affects the, the. I mean, the estrangement of Russia and, and our our like uh, cooling off, um, the cooling off relations. I don't think it affects Iran as much as Syria. Because... No, definitely. It affects Syria more. Although, look, the Russians don't want to be in this position as for the Syrians forever. I mean, you know, there are... Eventually, this becomes this, this provides downside for them as well. Mm-hmm. And certainly, it, it makes them... You know, they may see this also as making them more vulnerable uh, to, to terrorism. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think you, you've already seen some of the rhetoric out of, out of some of the jihadist groups in Syria that is very anti-Russian, as opposed to being anti-American. So they may view in the long term that this is, this is no longer helping them. But I think... Well, you know, in the near term, it's not, that's not going to uh, be... A- another worrisome thing is what this portends for the Muslim population in Crimea, too. Oh, um, absolutely. That, that, that has not been a very radical population traditionally, but they're very... You never know what, what will happen if Crimea is annexed and they start feeling that their rights are being... Uh, in front well, what of if the Ukrainians, you know, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're going to pay a big price, too, the ones who, once you end up staying. And will this create, you know, will right, it be... But there's, but there's no existing global jihad for them to join. That is true. That is true. I don't know how radicalized... I, I don't They're know. They're not. They have not historically been radicalized. Right. But this is the kind of thing that radicalizes people. But it also... Look, and if there is... If there's certainly incidents of anti-Muslim attacks by the Russians as well, it may, it may have a different effect, which is that it could um, ratchet up sort of the, the, the animus from global jihadist groups in general. I mean, you know, again, you see this in Syria. There has been a lot of anti-jihadist rhetoric out of Syria that's anti-Russian as opposed to, I mean, jihadist rhetoric is the anti-Russian as opposed to anti-American. That could get worse. It could make more problems for them. But of course, you know, that wouldn't be a new thing. That certainly relates to also to the, to the Chechen war as well. There was certainly a lot of that going on then too. Okay. Well, I guess we've, uh, we've, we've solved, solved, this little we've bit. solved the problem, I think. I think we solved it too. Yeah. It was awesome. We solved it. Yeah, yeah. I don't see any, I don't see any trouble ahead. No, I think, we're, I think, we're I, good. think I think we got it under control. Will you send the email to uh, Obama? <laughs> sure, tell sure. Him to do so whatever. You this attachment, and he'll just you know, yeah. solve. Yeah. Tell, him, tell him to keep some quivers in his arrow. That's right. all right. Well, thank you, Michael. Always a pleasure. Yeah.